turn in your uh, Bibles or whatever technology you brought with your word on there, turn to the book of Leviticus. It's an interesting portion of scripture I'm going to read to you this morning in just a moment. In Leviticus chapter 14, can anything good come out of the book of Leviticus? I think so. It's a, it's a, it's an interesting book. It's a foreign book to those of us who are New Testament believers. It's not one I don't suppose gets taught out of regularly, but we're going to look at some passages that through the years I've made note of, but I've never really just kind of zeroed in on them and taught from them. And for some of you, uh, these passages in Leviticus 14 that I'm going to uh, read to you in just a moment are going to be the first time you've ever heard this. And so I really want you to stick with me and zero in this morning because I think um, we've got some things that the Lord's wanting to say to us, and I hope you're open to receive it. We've been in the series that I've entitled Home Inspection. Home Inspection. And uh, our purpose was to make sure that our foundations and our life infrastructure are solid. You know, we're, we're entering into some really tough days, I believe, and so it, it, this is the moment to get our our infrastructure, our life intra infrastructure, our home structure, solid for the day of testing that is coming. And there are some of you here that already know the day of testing has arrived, amen? I, I mean, we, we are facing some incredibly challenging things, and we've been using Paul's passage. You don't have to turn here. We've mentioned it already in 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5, where Paul said to examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. And when he said that, basically he was saying, you've got to take a, a self-evaluation test. Nobody can take it but you. And, and to evaluate yourself to find out not only if you're right with God, which might be an important test to take, but for you to begin to understand how to journey in the faith, what it means to walk in the faith, what it means to walk with the Lord. Examine yourselves, he says, to see if you be in the faith. So... These messages have been messages that basically I've taught you and I'm leaving it to you to begin uh, to consider and take evaluation as to where you're at and what needs to be changed. Because I've learned this, I can't change anybody. Have you ever tried to be somebody's Holy Spirit? I've, I admit I've tried to be people's Holy Spirit at times and, and I'm finding out it's really hard to be the Holy Spirit. And so sometimes you just gotta let the Holy Spirit be the Holy Spirit. And uh, everybody says amen. Those of us that have tried to be the Holy Spirit say amen because we're worn out. And those who have been the object of us being the Holy Spirit too are saying amen be because they're tired of us trying to be the Holy Spirit. But how many of you know there is a real Holy Spirit? And your biggest problem isn't pastor. Sometimes your biggest problem is the Holy Spirit. So uh, I, I think the Lord wants to say something significant, and I've been praying that the Holy Spirit shows up to make application. I want to tell you a story before I read this passage in Leviticus. It was eight or nine years ago now. Our family was moving off of uh, James Island, and we were moving into an apartment in the West Ashley area. And we moved into this apartment, and uh, we were waiting for, uh, we had a, a track home that we lived in, and and we were waiting for some of the final touches on that construction, which took about six months. Um, but we were waiting and we, we were living in this apartment. And after several months of living in this apartment, something strange began to happen to me that had never happened before. One day I was standing in the little kitchen there in the apartment. And all of a sudden, out of the clear view, uh, clear blue, I, just, I began to be choked off. I mean, literally, I was choking. I hadn't eaten anything. I wasn't drinking anything. I was just, I was choking. And literally, I could not catch my breath. And for any of you that have not experienced that feeling, it's not a pleasant feeling. My eyes began to water. And, and, and when you are gasping for air and it's something unexpected, uh, it, it causes you to panic. And, and then it exasperates what's already taking place that's unknown to you anyway. And literally, I was just... And I couldn't catch my breath. It was like my throat had closed off. And my wife and uh, one of my sons was standing there. And they were watching me. And they're going, what, what? And I'm going, you know, you can't say anything. You're, you're, you're pointing. I'm choking. I'm choking. And, and they're feeling helpless as they're standing there. And I, I literally that day fell to my knees choking. 
And then just as quickly as it came upon me, it suddenly left. And I thought to myself, what in the world? I mean, I mean, it was a traumatic event. Uh, nothing happened perhaps for another couple of weeks or so. Uh, but then all of a sudden in that same apartment, about two weeks later, the same thing happened to me again. I started to be choked off. And this time it was like, okay, this has happened before. Um, and, and I wasn't quite as panicked, so I could relax a little bit more. It didn't seem to last quite as long, but nonetheless, it was still this, this choking that was taking place. Literally, I could not breathe. And by the time I moved from that apartment, and when, again, we lived there probably about six months, it probably happened at least a half a dozen times, if not more, to me while I was in that place. Well, we began to ask ourselves what in the world was going on. It wasn't happening to anyone else. It was only happening to me. And we came to the conclusion that in all likelihood, there was probably some form of fungus or mold that was growing in that apartment. I, those of you that may not know, if there's mold, mold can be dangerous for you, especially what's called black mold. And if it gets in the ductwork or it gets into the walls, um, it can literally be a health hazard, which is why when you do home inspections, one of the things they'll check for is mold. And that mold has to be cleansed from the house in order for you and your family uh, to be healthy. Now, maybe mold won't affect everyone, but obviously, and again, we weren't sure what the case was. We didn't own the apartment. We made mention of it. I was moving out, so I don't know what they ultimately did there, but, but, but it was left, God forbid, it was left for whoever else was going to move in there. But uh, for me, uh, I, I was moving to a new place, and, and uh, so it wasn't going to affect me. But mold in a house, if you're purchasing a house, if you're living in a house, mold is something you don't want in the walls or in the ductwork because, like it did to me, it can choke you off. Now, I tell you that story because it, in the natural, begins to paint a picture of something that I want you to get a hold of. Um, you may not have mold in your house, but there can be things in your house that can spiritually choke you off. It can relationally choke you off. And, and, and again, it may not be anything natural, but I just want to begin to ask the question and for you to begin to let the Holy Spirit use these questions as you begin to hear what I'm saying this morning by asking yourself, what shape is your house in? Now, you may say, well, are you talking about just the overall construction? No, I'm, I'm just talking about spiritually, relationally, you know, uh, you can have all the money and all the stuff in the world, but if you don't have peace, joy, hope, if you don't have those wonderful intangibles, I'll guarantee you it doesn't matter how much money you have in the bank. And so I want to ask you, what shape is your house in with regards to those things? Is it clean? Is it healthy? Is it a place of sterility or is it a place of fertility? In other words, is it a place where life can begin to spring up or is it a place of death? Is there hope or is there despair? Is there peace or is there war? Is there joy or is there anger? Is the atmosphere of your home a place that's choking the life out of you or is it a place that you find your family and your relationships blossoming and flourishing? I just want you to begin to do a real quick evaluation. You don't have to write it down. You don't have to speak it out loud. You can just do it inside on your own. And then I want you to go to this step. I want you to take the next step and ask yourself, have you ever wondered why your house may be like it is? And maybe it's time to do some evaluating that you've never done before. And I want you to keep that picture in mind because I want to read to you an obscure passage of Scripture that speaks to this area. As I said, it's, it's an unusual portion of Scripture, but listen to it. Because the message this morning I've entitled is this. Are there streaks on your walls? Are there streaks on your walls? In Leviticus chapter 14, beginning with verse 33, I'm going to read this. We'll post it on the screen overhead. Bear with me. I'm going to read through these verses, and, and, and your eyes are going to glaze for just a moment, but you're going to come back to me, right? All right, so don't glaze through Leviticus, but, but this is important, and I'll make... I'll make it make sense before we're done this morning. Verse 33, Leviticus 14. The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, 
When you have come into the land of Canaan, which I give you as a possession, and I put the leprous plague, now listen to what he says, and I, this is the Lord speaking, and I put the leprous plague in a house in the land of your possession. And he who owns the house comes and tells the priest saying, it seems to me that there's some plague in the house. Then the priest shall command that they empty the house before the priest goes into it to examine the plague, that all that is in the house may not be made unclean. And afterward, the priest shall go in to examine the house. And he shall examine the plague. And indeed, if the plague is on the walls of the house with ingrained streaks, greenish or reddish, which appear to be deep in the wall, then the priest shall go out of the house to the door of the house and shut up the house seven days. And the priest shall come again on the seventh day and look. And indeed, if the plague has spread on the walls of the house, then the priest shall command that they take away the stones in which is the plague, and they shall cast them into an unclean place outside the city. And he shall cause the house to be scraped inside all around. And the dust that they scrape off, they shall pour out in an unclean place outside the city. Then they shall take other stones and put them in place of those stones. And he shall take other mortar and plaster the house. They're doing a whole reno here. You're getting that, right? Verse 43. Now, if the plague comes back and breaks out in the house after he has taken away the stones, after he has scraped the house, and after it is plastered, then the priest shall come and look. And indeed, if the plague has spread in the house, it is an active leprosy. Some of your Bibles will say a fretting leprosy or an angry leprosy. So an angry leprosy has shown up. It is unclean. And he shall break down the house, its stones, its timber, all the plaster of the house, and he shall carry them outside the city to an unclean place. Moreover, he who goes into the house at all while it is shut up shall be unclean until evening. And he who lies down in the house shall wash his clothes, and he who eats in the house shall wash his clothes. But if the priest comes in and examines it, and indeed the plague has not spread in the house after the house was plastered, then the priest shall pronounce the house clean because the plague is healed. Then listen, and he shall take to cleanse the house two birds, cedar wood, scarlet, and hyssop. Then he shall kill one of the birds in an earthen vessel over running water. And he shall take the cedar wood, the hyssop, the scarlet, and the living bird, and dip them in the blood of the slain bird and in the running water, and sprinkle the house seven times. And he shall cleanse the house with the blood of the bird and the running water and the living bird with the cedar wood, the hyssop, and the scarlet. Then he shall let the living bird loose outside the city in the open field and make atonement for the house, and it shall be clean. Isn't that a wild passage? And I want to ask, are there streaks on your walls? Now the Lord was speaking to Moses, and if you'll just reference back, it's interesting that the Lord was saying to Moses really a prophetic word. They had not yet entered into the land of Canaan. They'd not yet entered into their promised land. But the Lord speaks to Moses and to Aaron, and he begins to share with them prophetically something that they would face when they would take the children of Israel finally into the promised land. Now, granted, they're in the wilderness. They're getting prepared. In fact, actually, that generation will have to die off, and a new generation will have to come. But nonetheless, God is giving instructions as to what they'll need to do when they come into this new era. They were to prepare for something that they would be facing. And so the Lord was saying, you know, as the Lord says, you know, hear ye, hear ye. Moses, this is going to be important. You need to remember that as you are going into the land, now think about this, the Israelites are going into a land. They're going in to possess the land. They would literally be dispossessing their enemies. And they would be living in the houses of the people that they dispossessed. 
And so as they would move into the land and as they would conquer the land, they would live in houses that they did not build. They would reap harvests that they did not plant. They would be compensated by the Lord for the centuries of slavery that they endured from the hands of their enemies. But the Lord said that when they moved into the land and they possessed these houses, that some of these houses, as they would go in and live in them, they would find on the walls to have red and green streaks on them. And he tells them that they're to go through this detailed cleanup process because the Lord says that the house would have a leprosy. And if it couldn't be cleaned up, then they would go into a great detailed renovation job. And ultimately, if the renovation job didn't clean the house up, the Lord said the very house would be destroyed and it would be taken to another unclean place. In fact, the Lord said if it reached the place where you got to the end point, that it was an angry leprosy or an active leprosy or a fretting leprosy, which meant that it was, it was of a strength and it was, it was of a power that it needed to be ultimately destroyed. Now, in order to get this, I, I got to lay some imagery down so you get a hold of this before we make practical application. Uh, remember and understand what leprosy meant. Let me just remind many of you would know this already, that in Old Testament times, there were numbers of diseases that probably fit under the label of leprosy. And my purpose here is not to go through all the intricate biology of what leprosy may or may not be. The important part is for you to understand what leprosy meant in the minds of the people and in the minds of the Lord. Leprosy literally meant spiritual defilement. It meant uncleanness. It meant that which was ungodly. Leprosy was used as sort of the designated disease in order for people to be uh, understanding of that which God considered to be a defilement. And so it was associated oftentimes, leprosy was, with certain sins. But generally it was seen as a state of defilement and alienation from God. That is why when Jesus comes along and he begins to heal the lepers, it was an amazing thing because Jesus was cleansing those that were alienated from God. There's a picture here of, of, of Jesus being able to cleanse that which was defiled and causing it to be once again receivable by the Lord himself. And so leprosy was, was something that was incredibly in, in, incredibly defiling. And we also have to remember that as the Israelites were moving into the land, that they were fighting different enemies, the Amalekites, the Amorites, the Jebusites, the, you know, the Parisiites. I could go through all the list of the ites. There were all these ites that they were fighting. And uh, as they were going into the land, they were about to, to possess these, these heathen nations, these ungodly nations, and they were going to begin to live in these homes that were heathen homes. They were literally dispossessing them. They were going in and they were going to live in them. I know that doesn't sound fair and I can't go through all the justice issues here. But the fact of the matter is they were dispossessing their enemies and they were going to live in that which had already been constructed in these heathen nations. Now, I'm going to remind you of something that seems real simple, but don't miss this as we're going through this. I want to remind you some things that most of you should already know about the Lord. So these are easy amen points. Number one. The Lord is omnipotent, which means he is all powerful. I mean, there's nobody bigger than God in the food chain. He's the top. Nothing can withstand him. Nothing even is close. He has no equal. He is powerful, almighty. He is God. Number two, he's omnipresent, which means that that he can be everywhere at once. He can be here. He can be there. He can be with me through the week and you through the week, and he can be with both of us through the week at the self same time. Only God can do that. And then finally, number three, which might be even the most applicable point this morning, is that he's omniscient. In other words, he sees it all and he knows it all. Omniscient. And so God speaks to Moses and to Aaron because God knows something about these houses that they don't know. And so he says to Moses, I am going to put a leprosy. He says, literally, I'm going to put the leprosy. I'm going to put the streaks on the wall. I'm going to put that which is red and that which is green on the wall. Now, I understand in New Testament under, understanding that there are some things here that, that kind of cause us to go trip because we really don't think God causes sickness. And I don't think he causes sickness 
either. I, I don't think he's the author of sickness. I think Satan and the curse is the author of sickness. But here's the deal that's happening under an old covenant. This is what God is saying. He's saying this, because the Holy Spirit had not been dispensed to dwell in the hearts of the people, listen to me, anytime you go through the old covenant, you'll find that the Holy Spirit came upon them, but it isn't until we get to the new covenant that we find the Holy Spirit residing in us. And because of that feature, and you know this to be true if you've read your Bible at all, the Israelites were not all that of a discerning people. I mean, Moses just takes a weekend trip up Mount Sinai, and they, by the time he gets back, they've already created a golden calf. I mean, you've got to be dense. After God had done all that he had done, and then two days without Moses, and they create a golden calf. So you understand, these people have really not much discernment. So what God says is, I'm going to step into this situation. You're going to be moving into heathen homes, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to help your discernment. That would help, wouldn't it? If something's wrong with the house, I'm just, the Lord says, I'm going to put green and red stripes on your walls. Now, you would have to be super dull or colorblind or a Christmas fanatic or something to not get that red and green stripes is God saying, I'm going to reveal to you that something in the house isn't right. Now, this is a good news passage. The more I began to think about this, because God God is so committed to his purposes in his people. God is so committed to bringing you into a land. God is so committed to bringing you into a destiny. God so has this wonderful, great, incredible, off the chain, over the top will for your life. He is so committed to these things that if something isn't right in your house, he'll paint the wall. He'll paint it and say something's not right here. God wants to unveil it. He wants to cleanse it. He wants to get it right. And this is what God says. He says, if it can't be cleansed, then it needs to be destroyed because my people don't need it. Now, let me explain what was happening in the houses. This is where it gets real interesting. There's a Jewish commentary that is called the Midrash. I know many of you spend your late nights reading the Midrash. You're all looking at me going, Midrash? I've never read that. No. It's a commentary. Even if it was in English, and I think there are English commentaries, but, but it's a Jewish commentary that illuminates some of the passages of the Old Covenant to help us understand some of what was going on behind the scenes. And according to the commentary, as the inhabitants of the land, the, all the ites, heard that the Jewish people were coming in order to minimize their losses, they began to hoard all the gold and the silver. They didn't want to lose what they had. And so they began to hoard all the gold and the silver. And the most predominant way to hide it and to hoard it was to melt it down. And then they would have it fashioned and formed into the shapes of their demon gods. Now you have to remember the Amalekites, you know, the... Uh, Amorites, the Parisiites, all the ites, Jebusites, Hittites, all the ites that were there. You have to remember, they all worshipped pagan gods. And so they melted down all of their precious metals. They fashioned these metals into demon gods. And then they would hide these statues in the walls of their home or under the foundation of their house. Archaeologists, as they have done digs, have even found some of these homes and buildings. And when these walls were pulled apart, they found these things, these, these little, uh, 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 just little, you know, just, just trinkets of, of gods and things that were, that were hewn out of gold and silver. And so literally what God was saying to Moses and to Aaron and ultimately to the people, he was saying this. He was saying what you can't see with your natural eyes. Because remember, you go into these homes. They were behind the walls. They were in the foundation. What the Lord was saying was this. What you could not see with your natural eyes, I'm telling you, it's there. And there's something that's wrong in the house. And it needs to get out of the house. Why? Because these demon statues were open doors for demonic activity to gain a foothold in their homes. Now, I, I, want, I want you to hear something because we just got done with Halloween and I'm not, I'm, I'm not really talking about Halloween aside from the fact that 
it, it's remarkable. It's, it's just remarkable to me. I'll just put it like that. It's just remarkable. I do not personally or technically believe in ghosts. I don't, think, I don't think there's such a thing as ghosts. However, I do believe in the existence of demons. Now, ghosts, in my biblical worldview, are nothing more than a familiar spirit or demon who takes on the appearance of someone you may know or think you might know. So when you go on a ghost walk, just remember, actually, you're going on a demon hunt. I'll just leave it there. How about that? And for them, listen, now, for, for a demonic entity to wreak havoc in our homes, there has to be an open door for them to have access. Now, it's interesting because Jesus, if you, if you think this is, oh, that's old covenant. Jesus said something I thought was really interesting in Matthew 12, beginning with verse 43. Listen to this. I'll just read it from the screen if you don't mind. He says, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest and finds none. Then he says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it empty, swept and put in order. Now, that's a good thing there. But verse 45 says, then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. So shall it also be with this wicked generations. You see what Jesus is beginning to say there is this is he's beginning to say that there's a cleansing that can take place. Isn't that good news? That it doesn't matter what evil, dark force might be oppressing or possessing or whatever the case may be, the blood of Jesus has the power to set us free. That our houses can be cleansed. This, this, this life, this body can be cleansed. It can be set free. My home can be set free. It can be at peace. That's good news. But here's the deal, and this is what Jesus is alluding to. The deal is this, that if we leave an open door, guess what? Others come in. So here, here's the key. We got to learn to close some doors, don't we? I want to tell you just a couple stories, just interesting things that have happened to me through the years. I'm going to tell them real quickly. Um, I remember years ago, my wife and I had just moved to Spartanburg, South Carolina, and uh, we were living in a little home uh, that was kind of in an odd location. It was kind of off by itself, an odd location. It was a rental, and we were living in this home. And uh, we moved in, and uh, of course, it met all our needs. It was it was rental property, and so you know it, what rental property is. It usually is, and and something interesting began to happen. Now, I'm not claiming to be the most discerning person, uh, and and we you know have been married 31 years plus. And those of you that have been married any length of time, how many of you know that just doing marriage with God on your side is challenging? I mean, I mean you can love the Lord and be spirit-filled, and this thing's still hard some days. Um, and so, you know, I'm not suggesting that we haven't had our challenges, and we've been very transparent about all of our challenges. There was something that was occurring. We moved into this home, and there was something that was happening that was beyond our normal challenges. I mean, there was something that was happening in our relationship that was that was causing alienation and strife and, and upheaval and war and the likes of which we had never faced. And, and there was just a day where it had reached such intensity. You know, you know, what happens is, is when 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 difficulty comes and especially intense difficulty comes, what happens is you either get discernment or you give up. We awakened and we just asked ourselves, what in the world is going on? And, and we had had just little bits and pieces of teaching here and there, enough to know that the Holy Spirit was illuminating something in us. And we began to do a little research and we found something out that was very interesting that we did not know. That that home that we had been living in had originally been a studio to do pornographic films. And we never knew that. You say, well, what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is, is that there had been an open door that had taken place because demons will find a place to reside either territorially or in someone's life. And suddenly when that revelation came and we understood that, we were able to address by our authority and by the blood to cleanse the house. Listen, you, you can doubt or be a naysayer, but I'm telling you, something was broke that day. We got revelation and peace came to our house again. 
Because something was in the house that wasn't clean. No, God did not. I wish God had painted the walls red and green. Wouldn't that have been great? Red and green. Something's here that you need to be aware of. Something's in the walls. But, but we're living under a new covenant to where God doesn't have to use paintbrushes. His Holy Spirit resides in you. Giving you discernment. And that was broken. I can give you more stories. I remember when Russia was open for the gospel and we were traveling back and forth. Many people were going back and forth to the former Soviet Union. And, and while they were there, there were, there were many, many things being sold off because, because inflation had skyrocketed. People didn't have, have enough money just to live. And they were selling anything and everything they could get their hands on. And so you would go to markets and there would be all kinds of things up for sale at markets. There were trinkets. There were a couple of things that were interesting. They had these dolls, and I think they were called babushka dolls. It was like they had a doll in a doll in a doll in a doll in a doll. You know, it had kind of, and they all fit in this one container, and it's kind of cute. And they had all kinds of religious icons and paintings and crosses and all kinds of things like that. And uh, people were going, great numbers of people from the church I was a part of was going back and forth, and these things were coming back. They were buying these things as souvenirs, bringing them back hanging them in their home, displaying them in their home. And all of a sudden, it seemed like there was an uptick, an upheaval that was going on in people's homes. It's interesting that when you begin to see something across the board that so many people are beginning to face, again, if there's any awareness or discernment, you awaken and say, something's not right here. And through discernment, what we began to understand was, and, and again, we love the Russian people, but listen to what I'm saying here, is that, is that these things that they were bringing home as souvenirs had been venerated as idols. They'd been worshipped as idols. Let me tell you, people worship. I don't care. I don't care if this offends anybody. I'll say it. If you've got a picture of Jesus up that you worship, something's wrong. Jesus, you know, no one had a Kodak camera for Jesus. I mean, it, you've, got, you've, you've got to understand that God is not... For idols, even if they make that idol into a picture of him. You understand the people when they made their golden calf, you know what they called the golden calf? Yahweh. So they created Yahweh in the form of a golden calf. And they worshipped it. And these trinkets were coming home from a foreign country. And they were being hung in the homes of Christian people. And all of a sudden, strange, crazy things were happening. And discernment came and awareness came. And we suddenly realized that doors were being flung open to a demonic realm. And things had to be dealt with. Some of it had to be destroyed. Some of it had to be cleansed. But I'm just telling you, the question is, you know, whether or not you want to keep your souvenir or whether or not you want peace in your house. Now, people ask, they say, well... How do you know that was the root issue? Or how do you know that was the open door? Well, again, it would always be nice to have God come paint our walls. But truthfully, it was the spirit of the Lord bringing discernment into the hearts and life and spirit of his people. You see, God isn't, I'll just say it right off the bat, God isn't going to paint your walls. He isn't going to give special streaks for you to see with your natural eyes so that you can know something is in the walls of your home. Those streaks we read here in the book of Leviticus are really representations of the ability to have eyes to see and discernment to recognize that something, something here is not right. Now, in this instance, it appears that the people of God had no part in bringing those demonic, defiling statues into the homes themselves. And truthfully, and I'll just say this as a side note. Truthfully, if, if you buy a home or you rent a home, you need to get on your knees. You need to ask God to help you identify if there's anything in there that the place needs to be cleansed. And you can, you can spiritually cleanse the house or the apartment, the rental property you have, and you need to cleanse it. I mean, we go into our homes and uh, I anoint, anoint doorways and I call upon the blood of Jesus to bring cleansing to the property. You don't know what took place there. Whatever the previous occupants may have opened the door to, whether it be intentionally or through ignorance. That's why when we come to this place every morning and we pray at 920, I mean, you do understand that all through the week, all of this is rented out to other people. All of this is used for other purposes. All of this has been opened up to all kinds of things that, believe me, I don't want hanging around my life. 
So we come in here and we pray and we cleanse the place because angry leprosy is still on the move and angry leprosy leaves streaks on the wall. And the, and the part is, is that we no longer consider this and we refuse to see it. And the fruit of that has been that our homes, now I'm talking about Christian homes. I'm not talking about people who don't know Jesus. I mean, we would expect people who don't know Jesus to live in upheaval. But truth of the matter is, we divorce at the same rate they divorce. We have the same statistics as they have. There is oftentimes no quality of distinction with regards to our life than there is to their life. Why is that? It's because I fear we've opened the door to things that we refuse to see. And God is saying there is streaks on our walls. We've got to get it out of the house. Something isn't right. Close the door. Cleanse the house. And let's let peace, joy, hope, and abundance come back to the homes of God's people. Amen. 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 Because our homes are sterile and they're lifeless, they're barren, they're battlegrounds. We're angry, we're full of despair. All God is saying is this, God is saying it's time to cleanse the house. And the good news is it can be cleansed. Now again, you may say, I don't know, Pastor, I don't know that I buy into that kind of stuff. Okay, well then don't. I can't make you do anything. You live in your barrenness. You live in your upheaval. You live in your chaos. You live in your anarchy. You do it your way. Just do it. I, I'll keep my peace. And I'll keep my joy. And I'll keep my stability. And I'll keep the life. Listen, these are the moments God is speaking, providing opportunity. If we have ears to hear. If I could go paint your walls, I would. But I can't be your Holy Spirit. And God isn't going to do it because he says, I'm giving you my Holy Spirit so that you can know. He will guide you into all truth, the scripture says. He will teach you. He will, he will convict you of righteousness, sin, and judgment. That's what the Holy Spirit will do. And so I just want to offer you seven assessment questions. And, and, and really, this will go fast. So you get your, get your pen ready because you're going to write fast. We'll put it on the screen so you can get it on the screen too. But I just want to give you seven assessment questions. You're not going to answer this to anyone but you. And of course, hear me, God is omniscient. He sees everything. Now you see, I don't see everything. Not that that would be a big deal for some people anyway. But God sees everything. So I just want to give you seven assessment questions that you can begin to ask yourself, and maybe the Holy Spirit will help you here. The text says, it's interesting as I was reading this, the text said in the the 35th verse, the Lord said to Moses that when they go and they find these streaks in their house, that they were to go and get the priest. Now, I don't know. This just was quickened to me. I, I just, I want to remind you a couple things here. We're not Catholic here. I have a lot of good Catholic friends and I love them as friends, but we're not Catholic. We're Protestant. What that means is, is that means that all of us can access God without a human mediation. Okay, I don't you don't need to go to a human in order to get to God. That's that's what the Reformation was all about. So I'm not your priest. So as you read that, don't think you're going to call me up and say, Pastor, I want you to come over. See if I got streaks on my walls. No, I'm not going to come over and see if there's streaks on your walls. You're going to get on your knees and because the Holy Spirit lives in you, you're going to seek God and you're going to ask God and you're going to begin to see what your discernment is like. Listen, I, this is my exhortation. I honestly think, men, I'm just I'm going to give you a little just two minutes. Just grit your teeth and take this from pastor for about two minutes and it'll be over. Men, you should be the priests of your home. It is time for men to start assessing the spiritual climate around them. I'm grateful for wives. I'm grateful for my wife. My wife is probably way more spiritual. In fact, I know her to be probably way more spiritual than I am. And I'm grateful for that. And she has wonderful input into my life. And I'm grateful for all of those things. But you know what? I'm just exhorting us all as guys. Men, it is time to arise and be priests and not passive. Come on, guys. Come on. Now, just say, yeah, you're right. You're right, guys. I got... I, 
Just say it. Just say it in the street. He's right. Pastor's right. I'm a man, and I need to be a man. I mean, we all want our wives to submit as, you know, submit, submit, submit. Well, let's start giving them something to submit to. Yeah, I hear the ladies. That was your chance, ladies. You could have waved your hankies on that one again. Go, Pastor. All right, guys, I'll let you go now. If you're a single woman, obviously you're going to have to probably do this for your own house. And if your husband just refuses to do it, then ladies, you just might have to get on your knees and as you're praying for your house, pray for him. But you must discern the atmosphere. You got to get the magnifying glass out. You cleanse the house because if something is choking the life out of the house, then you need to address it. And this is good news. Jesus says, I want to give you life. I want good things for you. God's not looking to pound you or to harm you. He's trying to set you free into a better day. And in verse 36 of that same text, what it says is, is that when you discern that, when the priest discerns it, then God says, get it out. And so I'm going to give you just seven assessment questions. And you can just dwell on this. I believe the Holy Spirit's going to ask these questions through my voice. And then I have to leave it at your your hands and your disposal. Number one is this. Really, these are, these are questions in order to discern if you've opened doors. These are really questions to discern if you've opened doors. Number one, have you compromised yourself with friends or activities? Have you compromised yourself with friends or activities? You know, we're all to reach the lost. We're all to reach out to people. We're all to be nice. We're all to be friendly. But, but there's a difference between reaching people and compromising with people. We all need friends. We all want friends. But there are things that my friends do that perhaps I can't do. And you know what? That's okay. I don't have to do what all my friends do, even necessarily to be friends. You need to set your own maturity level and aspirations. Your aspirations isn't just to be level with friends. Your aspiration is the fullness of the stature of Jesus Christ. And if your friends aren't going in that direction and they're sucking the life out of you and they're dragging you backwards and they've compromised your testimony or your household, then it's time to trust God for some new friends. Friends can open doors in your life. Sometimes we've got more loyalty to a friend than we do to the Lord. So ask yourself, have I compromised myself? Have I been drugged down by what others have said or done? Am I being dragged in a different direction? Listen, I, I love people. I love friends. But I'm here to tell you, I am after God. And if you're not after God, you probably aren't going to be able to stick with me. I've had people say, well, you need to relate to folk and you need to do this. No, you don't. The folk need to pursue God with me. That's what Paul said. I'm biblical. Follow me as I follow the Lord. Come after. It. Come on. You'll have, a, you'll have a far better time this way anyway. So have you compromised? Just ask, have I compromised? Only you and God can answer these questions. Number two, do you require obedience from your children or do you tolerate rebellion? These are open doors. Now, why would I put this one out there? It's because rebellion will eventually be an open door to a spirit. Demons love rebellion. They flourish in rebellion. I was at a restaurant, interesting, last night, Saturday night, I was at a restaurant. It was just a hamburger place. And, uh, well, it was probably an uptick from, like, McDonald's, but it was still a hamburger place. And we were in this restaurant. It wasn't very full. It was maybe, maybe I don't know, a third full. And all of a sudden in the restaurant, this is just last night, there was, there was a, a, a young child there, and we're not talking a baby, we're talking, I don't know, he had to be in his twos, threes, somewhere. I, I, I don't know how old these kids are anymore. I mean, because I'm getting older, but I mean, this kid, out of the midst of nowhere, I don't know what was going on. You would have thought someone had just poked him with a fork. He screamed a scream of bloody murder. And I mean, the whole, I mean, it was like, it was, it was ear-piercing ear shattering and it just and it just it just happened and it was like you couldn't help it i mean you're trying you know whenever you're at a restaurant you're trying not to stare at people and do it but i mean i mean when something like that happens you just can't help but just kind of gawk because you wonder what happened 
you wonder, you know, his parents were there and you just kind of wonder, what did you do? Did you knife him in the booth or, I mean, what did you do to him? And you could tell, this is what was funny. You could tell that they, I don't think they did anything. I think they were just trying to go to get their dinner. And whatever happened, it just happened. And it was interesting just kind of watching it. And, and it, was, it was interesting because um, at first it was like I could tell their method was, we're just going to let this pass. That was, their, that was kind of their method. <laughs> Here's what's always interesting to me. You may be able to tune it out, but there are probably about 40 other people in there. They were having a hard time tuning that out. <laughs> and, and, and then they went, of course, to pacify, and then ultimately what took place, because it was just bloody murder. I mean, I, the, the dad took him out. I don't know what happened to him. I know what my suggestion would have been, but I, but I don't know that that's what happened, but it, that he went out. Now, this is what I noticed. This is the illustration of it all is that that child in that restaurant seized the entire atmosphere. He seized it. That rebellion seized the entire atmosphere. I'm going to share this with you. I don't care if rebellion comes out of a two-year-old or it comes out of an 80-year-old. Rebellion is an open door that looses demonic activity. That is why we require obedience. That is why we bring correction. That is why. It's because if rebellion is allowed to flourish, demons will be sucked to that because that's what they love. You understand that a demon is a fallen angel and that fallen angel was rebellious. They love rebellion. Could be an open door. Number three, do you tolerate lying, deception, and dishonesty in the house? Wives, do you deceive your husbands? Husbands, do you deceive your wives? My wife tells this story that when she was growing up in her house, that uh, there were things that they planned to keep away from her dad. And there were things I know her dad had kept away from them. They openly, they openly share these things. They repented and, of course, are right with God. But, but those things open doors. That's an open door for demonic activity. I am amazed at the level of deception and dishonesty in God's people. I'm amazed that we live with this stuff. People who hide their junk, they think that they're hiding it from everyone else. But let me tell you something. You're not hiding things from God. You may get away with it at work. The government may not know you're hiding it. I mean, it's just mind-boggling what we think we're going to get away with. Listen, folks, I'm just telling you, God sees it all. He sees it all. Number four, don't you love this? Yes. Are there streaks in your walls? Four, are you speaking curses instead of blessings in the house? Are you speaking curses instead of blessings in the house? Are you speaking life or are you speaking death? We're studying this in life group, by the way. That's one of the reasons you might like to be at life group, because we're talking about how our confession needs to be appropriate. Are you speaking positive or are you speaking negative? Uh, my wife and I, I'm just telling you about our house. We're on a fast in our house to cut off all negativity and negative expectation. Let me tell you something. I didn't realize how hard that would be for me. I mean, I mean, just ask, just, just, just sensitize yourself to every negative thing that normally comes out of your mouth and just ask the Holy Spirit to just smite you if anything negative comes out of your mouth and you're going to live smitten a lot. <laughs> yeah, at least I have been. I've been amazed. I just, it's just been, a, I've just purposed to, to, to just get a positive expectation. And I want God, you see, I want God to move for me, don't you? I want God to move in my house. I want God to expand me and enlarge me. I want God to do miracles, supernatural things. But we have to create a faith-filled, expectant atmosphere. That is what God moves in. He moves in an atmosphere of faith. But yet when we're speaking curses and we're speaking death, who do you think that draws? See, don't expect miracles if you can't speak life. If you can't speak it at the house, if you can't speak it into, into the walls. I mean, these are open doors to leprosy. Number five, are there any addictions or sinful practices that are happening in the house? Are there any addictions or sinful practices that are happening in the house? You see, addiction 
really is the uh, psychological term for what the Bible calls bondage. Now, you're going to find that I'm not going to I'm not going to try to just codify things here for you there. I understand that there can be legitimate things that can be done in moderation. But for many people, uh, they've reached the place that they can no longer do certain things in moderation. And when you can no longer do certain things in moderation, it becomes an addiction. It becomes a bondage. And what that means is, is they live for it and they need it. Now, I understand in some of our circles that we have codified certain things. I know, for instance, you know, alcohol consumption can can. I understand the Bible can't you cannot get out of the Bible teetotalism. I get it. I, I get that Jesus really turned water into wine. Boy, I read that and I get it. I get that Paul said to Timothy to take a little wine for your stomach's sake. So I get the place of moderation. I understand these things. But do you understand that moderation can turn into addiction? And so it may be legal. It may be permissible. I mean, there are people, I mean, I'm one of them. I mean, I love to eat. I don't know about you, but I love to eat. Give me a buffet and I will damage it. I'm going to the fair today and I'm here to tell you my heart is already going please don't do this to me please don't do this to me because I am going to suck down some fried stuff so I get it I, I you know but if you if you lived off fair food every day that might be a problem now so hear me when I'm saying this you know, because what we do is we say to ourselves, well, this is legal. God doesn't say I can't do it. God doesn't say this, is, this isn't for me. Listen, you got to get to the place where you begin to understand this isn't about just a black and white codified system. Some people, if they just sniff a beer, they're addicted. I understand others can down one or two and it ain't no big deal. I got that. But you can't fool yourself saying you got it handled when you don't have it handled. See, this is the hard part. This is, this is what it means to get spiritual. Because there are some things others may do that you can't. TV can be an addiction. And when I say drugs, I'm just not talking about illegal drugs. There are some legal drugs that can be addictive. Lotteries, gaming, I can go down the list. I'm not saying, hey, if you want to play bingo for a $10 pot, who cares? If you want to go play a lottery... You know, and, 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 you know, spend a couple bucks. I don't know. I don't think you're going to hell because of it. But I'm just saying there's some people that can't go that direction because the minute they step into it, they're addicted. And let me just say this. It's amazing to me how most lotteries, for example, are played by those who are least able to afford it. Are there any addictions? I can't answer what, what, what an addiction or a sinful practice Come on, are we going to be a mature people or are we going to look for the lowest common denominators? Is God painting red and green stripes on your wall and saying to you, this can't be here anymore? There are probably some TVs that need to go. I don't know. If you can't handle it, then what do you do? Do, do, you, do you let it become angry leprosy? Or do you say, get it out? I don't know. See, I can't answer that for you. You can't answer that for me. That's why, that's why the Holy Spirit is going to have to reveal and teach these things. See, that's what it means to be spiritual. You see, it was easy for the Israelites. It really was, at some points, easier to live under the law because, you see, you knew exactly what the checkoff list was. But the problem was is that they might have got the checkoff list right, but the rest of their lives were thoroughly and completely out of order. And so Jesus comes along and he says, yeah, you've checked the boxes right because you've heard it said that if you commit adultery, it's really, really bad. But I tell you that if you lust for someone in your heart, then you've already done the sin. And all of a sudden, he made this thing. You can call it tougher or you can call it more spiritual. Because he's saying, now I'm asking what's going on inside of you, not that you just check the box off. So you come to church today, that's a good thing. You can do it by checking the box off, or you can say, I need to be in the house of God. I need to hear the word of the Lord. I need to pursue God's presence with those of like faith. There are two totally different ways to approach all of this. Number six, amen. Is there astrology, witchcraft, or the occult in the house? 
These are lightning rods for demons. Now, I'll say this again. Everybody in the room is going to have to decide what the acceptable level of demonic activity for your house is. Yeah, I, I want that to kind of ripple for a minute. What's the acceptable level of demonic activity? I, I don't have any way to do it. I, I, I remember when we were monitoring our children when they were young, it was funny watching them because they knew, they knew instantly what they could watch or not watch. But you're going to have to evaluate these things. What books do you let in? What cartoons do you let in? What TV shows do you watch? What movies do you go see? What are you going to let into your house? Now just ask yourself. I'm not going to tell you what you can and can't do. I'm not going to force you to do my list. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to just suggest you get on your knees. You get mature. You get discerning. Where are the streaks in your walls? People are, you know, I'm, I'm amazed that people, people are, are saying to me, uh, lately, can you can you imagine, Pastor, how, how big the Halloween holiday, and I'll use that term in quotations, has become? I've been amazed. My neighborhood has been transformed in just recent years. I mean, it's, we, had a, we had a zombie thing the other day going on, and there were kids eating some gnarled up dead body on their driveway. I mean, I'm going, what, what in the world? I mean, you know. And, and, and we're all going, why is this such a big deal? You know why it's a big deal? It's because as a nation and unfortunately as a church, we've opened up doors to demonic activity and the demons have flooded into our nation to the point where now we'll put lights up for Halloween and those same houses won't do a thing for Christmas. Now, I'm just simply saying it's an observation. You do what you want. I understand for many it's just a harmless little thing. Hey, it's just about the candy. Okay, I'm not, don't do it. I'm not saying you have to do what I say, please don't walk out of here and say, he's just a nut. Well, I may be a nut, but I'm not asking you to do it. I'm just saying, are there streaks on any walls? Ask yourself the question, because you're going to be the one that's going to call me asking for counseling. And then I'm going to look at you and go, streaks on the wall? Number seven, and then it's over and you made it. Do you allow pornography, obscenity, or licentious pictures or films in the house? Demons are flowing into the homes of this nation through internet screens all over the world. And we wonder why our homes have streaks on the walls. I'll finish with this. The first home that Tracy and I ever purchased together. I remember it was about 1,200 square foot. Um, it was just a little starter house. That time, <clears throat> we only had clay. And, and, you know, clay was of the age that you could put him down. He was still in a crib, but, you know, it was like he could almost not be in the crib. He was kind of that age area. Because if you put him in a regular bed, it, you, did, you didn't know whether you could keep him in there or not. And, and so, in fact, we'd put him in the, in the you know, the uh, crib and you'd put the bed down as low as it would go. And, you know, he'd, he'd, I remember putting him to bed. He'd stand on that crib and hold the top of it and he'd shake that thing like he was, like he was a criminal wanting to get out of there, you know. <laughs> he'd just, you know, and, and, and I remember trying to get him to go to sleep. It was like... Uh, it, it was crazy, you know, you'd, you'd, you'd put him down and we did that whole thing where you'd let him scream for a little while and then you'd go in and comfort him and then you'd let him scream for a little while longer and you'd go in and comfort him. And then finally I just looked and I said, I, I, I'm done. The next time I go in, I'm going to whoop that kid if he doesn't, go, <laughs> he doesn't go to sleep. He don't need comforting. He needs, a, he needs a tannin is what he needs. But Clayton would do this, man. You'd leave him go and then he'd crawl out of that thing and he'd come out in the, you know, into the living room and it was just... Clayton was our wild child. But one night we were sitting there in our living room and, and the living room faced in such a way that you could kind of see a piece of the hallway. And I'll never forget that night. We were watching television or something, Trace and I. Clayton had already been put to bed. And all of a sudden, out of our peripheral vision, we saw what looked to be a shadow that went by on that wall. It was at night now. It was a shadow that just went by. We both saw it. And... I said, Trace, did you see that? She said, yeah, I saw that. Did you, you see what looked like a shadow? I said, I wonder if that, if that Clayton got out of bed. I can't believe, I thought he was asleep. 
So I got up and I went, I went down the hall to check on him. And I opened the door. And when I opened the door, he was, he was sound asleep. There was no way that could have been Clayton. And suddenly it dawned on us at that particular moment that we weren't the only ones in the house. And I remember that night I said, you know, sweetie, we'd already experienced the one rental house. I said, you know, we, we hadn't done our business with this house yet. And I think tonight's the night that we got to cleanse the house. You say, well, what did you do, Pastor? Well, you know what the text says to do, what the priest was to do? It said that he got hyssop and he, he got these birds and he got all these sorts of things. He killed one of the birds and he spread the blood. And you understand, we don't go out and get birds anymore for... We have perfect blood at our disposal now. His name is Jesus. But they would spread the blood over the house. And when the blood was spread over the house, the scripture in Leviticus literally said that the priest would make atonement for the house. So we went through our house that night. And we called on the blood of Jesus and said, Lord, Cover the house with your blood. Let the, let the blood set us free and set this territory free. God, this is yours now. We call upon the blood and we went through and we prayed through all the rooms. It didn't take long, just a moment really or two. It was well worth the time. And all I can tell you is this, that after that, we saw no more shadows. I know that night, and if you walked out of here and asked her about that shadow, she'd remember that night as if it were yesterday. I'm telling you, there are streaks on our walls. There are open doors in our homes. And the time has come for us, if we want the victory God says is available for us, that we've got to cleanse the house and shut the door. And let Jesus be king of it all. Wouldn't you think so?